Okay, so yes, uh, building an interactive training environment using JupyterHub. Um, now, who here has used Jupyter before? Anything to do with Jupyter? So it might be why you're here and wondering, why am I talking about JupyterHub? So we'll find out why. So we've got some latecomers coming. We'll just wait two seconds for them to come in. Lunch must have been very good, or at least the, the conversation. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter whether you have been doing programming uh, for a very, very long time like me, or you're a new person. We're all in this situation where we need to learn how to use uh, software at different times, and it's not necessarily a simple thing. It can drive us nuts. Uh, everyone agree with that? Or does everyone here never have a problem with getting software to work? Because if you are, if you never have a problem, then you're that 10 times mythical developer thing everyone keeps talking about, I guess. Uh, we all have this problem. Um, we all get caught up. Now, source of information we can go to. The primary one is generally online documentation, and I, I do hope you uh, use that. And if you're old like me, you might remember what books are. Uh, but usually online documentation. But unfortunately, more likely these days you're doing this. You're going to Stack Overflow. Uh, I like to call the newer people who do programming the copy and paste generation uh, because that's what they do. Uh, I like to hope that is because employers don't give people enough time to actually learn things, uh, but unfortunately it's not always the case. A lot of people often just don't want to learn stuff, and so they just go straight to Stack Overflow and find what they need, copy and answer, and keep going. And they never really truly learn something in depth, which is a bit disappointing these days. When we talk about organisations and working in with companies, uh, relying on people using online documentation or going to Stack Overflow uh, or learning by osmosis from their colleagues isn't necessarily seen as being an ideal solution for people to learn about software they need to learn about. Uh, what they want to see is more structured training uh, that they can put their employees through because they feel that by doing that they got a guarantee that at least that information is getting in front of their employees and their employees can be more productive. Now this is the bit of the world that I come from where I am a developer advocate for OpenShift with Red Hat and it's my job to go around and educate people on how to use Kubernetes, containers, uh, how to deploy applications into that uh, or even just uh, branching out maybe specifically related to how to explain to people how to deploy Java apps or Python apps and so on. And my background is Python. I've been doing Python for way too long and I don't want to say how long, um, but I've been doing it quite a while. And if you don't know of me, I'm actually the author of ModWhiskey, which is the Whiskey server module for Apache. Uh, I also write another diabolical package called Wrapped, which you may not have heard of, which is helps you can write decorators, but actually its real purpose is to do what's called monkey patching, and you've probably all heard people say monkey patching is evil, and yes, this package does lots and lots of evil stuff. So they're my two claims to fame. So supervised training, um, I do a bit of that with my work, and also with that, it's not just going in there and going into an organisation and doing training. We need to provide training where someone can take something and go back and do it themselves, more self-paced training. So that's the world I live in. The bigger problem I have when doing this is this. You know, everyone here is going to have a different computer. And like that example there of the picture of supervised training was a lab environment set up in a room where you, all the PCs are all set up and you can set up the software in advance and have a known guaranteed environment. But more likely what happens is you go into a place, everyone brings their laptops, and there can be a mix of corporate laptops, which might run Windows, some people might have Macs, other people might have Linux. And that makes it really hard. And if we talk about Python world now, which you'll be able to relate to, Python especially is a bit of a problem. You might have a lot of people here on Python 3.7, some on Python 3.6. And then you've got those people who are stuck with CentOS or real laptops which have got Python to 7. Uh, no environment is the same. So when we come to do training, that makes it really, really difficult because you can't guarantee what people are going to have. And in a corporate world, their laptops may even be locked down. They can't actually install anything new. They're not allowed to. Uh, so it makes it very, very difficult. Um, so it works for me. That doesn't work. 
it does, well, it's, not, it's just not a good enough uh, excuse when uh, something goes wrong when you go out and do this training. So what we need is a reproducible environment. And we need to have it the same. We can't have it similar is close enough. Like, oh, great, I can give everyone a, a beer stein here and you can have beer, but they're not all exactly the same. So you're not guaranteed that everyone's going to have that same experience and get totally drunk. Um, someone might spill it over them instead. Uh, and I don't drink, by the way. <laughs> there are some solutions out there to solve this in terms of training environments you can get there. And a big one that you may have seen and heard about is one called Open edX, where you can actually go there yourself, sign up, and do online courses. Uh, another one is called Catacoda. Now, these are often quite heavyweight solutions. They're offered as services, usually, although Open edX you can install yourself. But it's based around using virtual machine environments. And that is that each person doing that course will get their own virtual machine, which has had a full operating system set up in there. Uh, and all the bits and pieces are in there that they need, but it just means it's very heavyweight. Now, I'm doing a, a <coughs> workshop on uh, Saturday, which uh, anyone signed up for that one? You remember? A few? Uh, I'm going to have 50 people in there. I don't want to go and set up 50 virtual machines for everyone. That's a big expense, a lot of work with ensuring your scripting and everything works. It'd be nice to be able to get one more centralised uh, shared environment that everyone can work in. And that's where containerization comes in. So rather than virtualization and having a whole operating system for every person, containerization and popularised by Docker, uh, the idea that one can bundle up your application, uh, your software bits and pieces for one particular application and, and deploy it on a host in an isolated, isolated environment called a container or a sandbox. And you can deploy more than one on that one machine. Because all the container is doing is essentially putting a wrapper around a set of processes. So it's a very lightweight version. So we could have done it with virtualization, but our goal is trying to do this with containerization. And part of the reason is we're actually trying to teach people how to use a container platform. <coughs> Okay. So there's two parts to this. We want to be able to make it easy to deploy our whole training environment for multiple users, but we also want to be able to package up the workshop, environment, workshop content itself. So we have all these bits and pieces of software we need to run, which provide us with all the tools and everything we need. We also have to put that content in there. Containers provide us a way there with a Docker image of bundling up our whole workshop content plus all the application software you need to run it. So someone can go and get that workshop as a container image, deploy it on Docker Hub or on Kubernetes or OpenShift, and actually go through that workshop. And everything is there in that image that they need. And the software will come up and start up for them. So quick demo time, because these always go wrong, so it's always fun. Um, so I've said all that and tried to, set, tried to set a bit of groundwork. But what am I really talking about? So we have a, a piece of software which we've built, which we, we call Homeroom. And we can use that to create these different training courses. So I'll be doing, some, on Saturday, uh, I've got one workshop slot, but I actually get two workshops that we can go through in that. One's on Kubernetes and one's on building container images. So what will happen on the weekend is that people will come along to this page and they'll be able to uh, identify themselves. I've got to make sure I spell my name right, grumpy. And which workshop this Kubernetes? So I have a homeroom here deployed inside of a Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster. And I've come in, identified myself, and it's now currently spinning up my own workshop environment using this homeroom. Um, and hopefully this will start up relatively quickly. So that's spun up my workshop environment container, and it's going to bring up a in my web browser, and this is a web browser, I've, I've knocked off the bar off the top, but it is a web browser, trust me. And so in that web browser page now, it's given me access to my workshop content on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I've got some terminals. So that's a terminal I'm accessing in the browser. It's not a terminal on my own machine. That terminal is running, in a, sh running a shell, which is inside the same container where the software is that's deploying this whole dashboard. Um, so I can actually just go through here, read the workshop content, go through all the steps, and we'll have these instructions at various points that you need to run over here in the terminal. 
We've even made it simpler, because one of the big problems we have with workshops is that people will type things in wrong. We will spend most of our time in a workshop debugging where people do silly things like that. We don't even have to worry about that, because as you go through and see these instructions, you'll see an instruction here you need to run. You see this little play icon on the right-hand side? I can just press that. It'll run the command for me. Okay? And we can, when we deploy this content, can we're deploying it for each individual user who has been identified, and it means we can actually parameterize that content, content with their username. So if we need to run any commands which has their username embodied in the command or other information, we can set it up individually for them. So it's always just click, click, click. Worst case, if we're dealing with a user interface, and in this case we have a, a web console here for our OpenShift cluster, uh, then there's another way of annotating that so that they can click on it. It'll put a copy into their copy and paste buffer, and then they can go over in here and, and paste it into the, the web console. Uh, finally, one of the things that our, our dashboard allows is we can also embed slides, so I can actually then drop into a presentation if I need to to do my talk as part of our workshop and just go through there and do my work, uh, slide content. And then I can drop back and let people get on with their, their workshop. So that is Homeroom. That's the, ultimately what we've done and what all that explanation of what, why uh, is to do that, to make it very simple to provide a workshop content for people to do, either in a multi-user setting where we're going to do something like on Saturday or where we could host this on a website and people could come to it at any time and do it as a self-paced learning thing. And I mentioned multi-user. Um, we can bundle up that software for the workshop content along with our software that runs it and that dashboard. We can deploy a single instance of it in Docker, just Docker run, it'll work. But we need to provide an easy way of spawning up many, many instances of this for a classroom type environment. And this is where JupyterHub comes in. Now, if many people had used JupyterHub, and you may be thinking, but JupyterHub's for running Jupyter Notebooks. So why am I using JupyterHub? The thing is that although JupyterHub can spin up Jupyter Notebooks, you can actually substitute Jupyter Notebook for something else. The reason for that is that if we look at the architecture of JupyterHub and think about what happens when I come and log in. So I come in, I hit the URL for JupyterHub, and what it will do first off is it will do an authentication step for me. And in that case, before I had that, it would provide, expect me to have a username and login uh, or username and password. Once it has authenticated me and it says, okay, I'm happy for you to come in and do something and access this, it will go off and spawn, usually, a Jupyter Notebook instance. Now, if you're running uh, Jupyter Hub on a single machine by itself, that Jupyter Notebook instance would just be a sub-process. Uh, but there are other ways of also integrating Jupyter Hub with other means of spawning things, which we'll go to in a sec. Once it has set up that Jupyter Notebook instance, it will redirect you to that Jupyter Notebook, and then you'll just start interacting with the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so I can replace that Jupyter Notebook with anything I want. It doesn't have to be Jupyter Notebooks. So the point of this talk is to just highlight the fact that you can do this with JupyterHub. So if you're in an organization where you have used it and you think, oh, I have other role, things I need to do where I might want to provide a single instance of an, of an application and have authentication and multiple instances for different users, JupyterHub may be a quick way of solving your problem. For, certainly for was for us. So I mentioned that normally you would set up a JupyterHub instance to uh, run up an instance of Jupyter Notebook as a sub-process on the same machine. But it, it's a pluggable system, and this is what's really good about JupyterHub, is that I, lots of different spawners that one can plug in. So I can tell it to spawn an instance of a Jupyter Notebook from a Docker image as a Docker container, again, on the same host. Or if I want to go beyond one host, I can actually drop it inside of Kubernetes, and then that will spawn up uh, my Jupyter Notebook image inside a different container, which in Kubernetes is called a pod, and it can even distribute them across many, many machines, which means I can scale out by adding more and more machines. I can handle a larger and larger classroom environment. And at Berkeley University, where a lot of the work was done with JupyterHub, they are literally having thousands of students at a time 
on this by distributing it across lots and lots of different machines using JupyterHub. So JupyterHub and Kubernetes, that's what we're doing. We're using, I'm doing with this with OpenShift, which is Red Hat's distribution of, of Kubernetes. But any Kubernetes distribution using anything else besides OpenShift, you can still take JupyterHub, get it going in there and in there. And as I said, it'll spawn up a Jupyter Notebook instance for you in a separate container and can distribute that across many different hosts for you. And it's really simple to do that. One of the great things I like about JupyterHub is when you configure it, its configuration file is not YAML or JSON, it's Python code. So that is an example of a snippet from the JupyterHub config file. It's Python code, I just put in there that I want to use a spawner, which is Kubernetes. And for that particular spawner, I then say, here is the location of my image, which is for my workshop in this case. So rather than being Jupyter Notebook, it's my workshop image, which has my software for the workshop and my content. Give it the command I need to start up, what port, and now when I go hit Jupyter up, it'll create my workshop content for me instead of Jupyter Notebooks. So in Kubernetes, that'll end up resulting in a separate pod for each person. Okay. It's also pluggable in terms of authentication. Uh, you can set up uh, authentication to be anonymous or you can tie it to uh, Google's OAuth or GitHub or corporate OAuth endpoints or any SSO system. Uh, that's all pluggable. Um, and again, very simple. If I wanted to actually make it anonymous access, that's all the config I needed. Or if I wanted to hook it up to Google, I can drop that in. I have to set a few environment variables so it knows where what the secrets are and so on, but that's all I need to do. So it's really quite easy to actually configure JupyterHub to do these things and make it a really useful system, not just for Jupyter Notebooks, for other stuff as well. But <laughs> that's all well and good, but there's some gotchas. So if you are going to go down this track, there's a few things you do need to know about in terms of the requirements placed on any app that you're going to use to substitute there instead of Jupyter Notebooks. For this, to explain this, we'll, we'll look at the architecture of the JupyterHub a little bit differently again. So I said, we'll come in to the URL for JupyterHub. It'll first off send us through the authentication and authenticators. Once it is happy, adds as a user entry into the database and it will spawn off an instance of our notebook image. Now, when it does that, it has, still has one host name which you're going to access the JupyterHub instance. Each individual user's notebook or application, in our case, our workshop training environment, is going to appear at a sub-URL. So requirement ver number one for your application, if you're going to do this, is that you need to be able to have your web application, whatever you're providing, appear at a sub-URL, not at the root URL of the site. Um, usually that's fairly easy. Um, if if you're using a Python WSGI for application, for example, a, a WSGI service will automatically handle this for you. Uh, if you are using Node and some funny framework, then you might have to do some funny things in, in those with setting up the base URL and telling it. But JupyterHub will tell you where you need to put it. So when that process gets set up or in, in the container, uh, it'll pass in this environment variable saying that this needs to be, your instance needs to be at this sub URL, and away you go. Our next problem is authorization. Now, I kept mentioning that when we went to JupyterHub, it would authenticate us. So it's going to check that we're allowed to do, get in access. Now, it may be anonymous, but it also may ask you for login and password. When it spawns off that instance of the notebook or our workshop environment and redirects you, once it's gone and redirected you, all of the traffic at that point goes directly through this configurable HTTP proxy thing sitting out the front, and it goes direct to your instance. The authentication thing is now out of the picture. There's a problem here, if you're thinking far enough ahead. And that is, if I can find out that URL, the user name, sub-URL for a particular another user, I can go direct to theirs and get access to their session because there's no extra step happening in that HTTP proxy. So that's really not good. So what we need to do is that we need to do extra authentication in this app. And the way that JupyterHub handles that is that it first off redirects you through to the notebook or our workshop environment. 
and we'll have to embed inside of, or Jupyter Notebooks have embedded inside it a bit of magic going on with OAuth, which is a, a protocol, for, protocol for handling authentication. When it comes in, it will see that, oh, and this is a new request. I don't have a cookie that knows anything about this session. It's actually going to do a funny little handshake and send back that request. It's going to redirect you back to JupyterHub again to a OAuth endpoint on JupyterHub. JupyterHub will go, oh, look at you and say, well, I had a cookie from you and you authenticated. Yes, I know you're allowed. I'll therefore send you back to the notebook again with an access token to say, yes, they're OK, here's their access token. And the notebook will then use that access token to talk back to JupyterHub using that API auth endpoint just to verify that token is valid, and then you keep going. After that point, the notebook instance has a cookie itself to validate your session, and every time you come through a request, it'll say, yes, I'm, you're OK, you're OK. And if not, it'll send you back again. Okay. So if you're going to do this and replace Jupyter Notebook with something else, then you do need to do this OAuth handshake, and it is fiddly uh, to get your head around um, understanding OAuth and doing that, but you do need to do it. So they're the two requirements. But if you can do that, you can drop in anything. Um, and again, that information about what you all think you need to do that OAuth, all that information gets passed through to you so that you can actually do that OAuth handshake with. But what else does JupyterHub provide? Uh, and this is where it comes really good, especially in combination with Kubernetes. The first thing it can provide is that if you were not using Kubernetes in this case, but you're spinning up Jupyter Notebook instances on the same machine in separate processes, there's no real controls on how much memory you can use. One person can monopolize things and use up all the memory in the box. When we're talking about Kubernetes, it's possible to start defining limits on the amount of memory and CPU that each instance is allowed to use. So if you know for a particular Jupyter Notebook session you only need one gigabyte of memory, you can enforce that. And that's very simple again. In that config file for uh, JupyterHub, you just have to set this, this memory limit and you can set what that instance is allowed to use. And similarly, you can set for CPU limit. Even if when we have this though, you only ultimately got so much memory on your system and you don't want people to you don't want too many sessions coming in. If I were to make this anonymous access and put it out on the internet and someone puts it on uh, uh, Slashdot or if that's people still even know what that is, uh, or Reddit or um, Hacker News, and suddenly I get thousands of people hitting my site and I've only got enough memory for 10 people, it's not going to work very well. So you can also define session limits or server limits, uh, and that is the number of instances allowed so that after that set number is reached, it'll bl start blocking people and say, sorry, I'm too busy, you're too busy, come back another time. Uh, even when we have those sessions, they, we can't allow those sessions to run forever because if we never clean them up, okay, we get to 10, it doesn't matter if those 10 people go away, you're never going to get rid of those sessions and ne allow the next people in. But you can actually set up in JupyterHub, it allows this concept of uh, JupyterHub services when you can actually plug in extra bits of code which will run as a sub-process which you can use to interact with its API to query the state of all the sessions. Uh, so what sessions there are, whether they've been uh, active or whether they've been idle. In this case, we can write up this session culling script and plug it into JupyterHub so that says that if your session has been idle for more amount of time, we can start deleting them. And that way we can free up that capacity to allow more users to come in. So that's JupyterHub. Um, they're the main features out of JupyterHub, but we wanted to go a step further. Like, I want to do training about Kubernetes. Uh, now, who, who's heard of Kubernetes already before? Half the room. So Kubernetes is a platform that allows you to deploy applications to many, many hosts. So it's, it's deliberately meant as a system to help you scale up apps to be able to handle many, many uh, users and your load of your app. So rather than instead, of, instead of having one machine, you can have it automatically handle for a lot of more machines. When you deploy stuff to uh, Kubernetes, uh, it will, can give you a namespace to work in uh, to deploy your particular app, so it can handle multiple users having different apps in different little namespaces. So I have to work on providing training for that. Now, for JupyterHub, it gives me a place to run my workshop environment, but I need to be able to hook that into now Kubernetes so that I can train people on how to use Kubernetes. 
To do that, I need to provide them that place to pray, their own project. Now, Jupiter Hub itself doesn't do this. All its job is to spawn instances of notebooks or something else. So what I want is to be able to, for each user who comes in, in addition to their own container or pod, which is running their instance of the workshop environment, I want to create them a separate project. Now, by default, when I deploy JupyterHub, my JupyterHub instance and all of those pods for each individual workshop session are all in one project. I want to give people their own separate projects so they can actually deploy their own applications into it. Now, to do that, I have to get a bit dirty inside of JupyterHub, but it does provide this ability, so I'm not doing anything too evil. I'm not having to monkey patch stuff. I haven't not having to use my wrap library. JupyterHub provides various hook points that one can hook in at the phases of it creating your instance. There's one called a pre-spawn hook and another one called a modified pod hook. This means that in the process of spinning up my instance of a Jupyter Notebook instance or something else, I can actually add in code which is executed to do other things. So what I'm going to do in my case is I can plug in some code which is given the information about the user and then go talk into the Kubernetes REST API to create a separate namespace for that person to work in and create all of the extra bits and pieces required to allow the person to access that. So that means that whereas my original uh, namespace which had JupyterHub instance and all my sessions in it was called Grumpy, it means that I can actually give each individual user their own, own project namespace to work with and they can go off and do things. It solves that problem of what we need to do with training people in Kubernetes. And that happens for all of those uh, hooking points. Now for that, we do need to do some magic stuff. Um, you can't just open up uh, X full access to the Kubernetes cluster because it's a shared environment in this case. If we were to do nothing and said, okay, here's Kubernetes, I'll create your namespace, but you go off and do whatever you want, <laughs> they'd be cluster admin. They could destroy the whole cluster, including my JupyterHub, and we don't want that. Kubernetes has this thing called role-based access control, and we can set up what are called service accounts. And so what we do is we create a separate service account for each user, and then we'll set up all this role of what they're allowed to do within that cluster. So by default, that will be, oh, you can just deploy some apps in that namespace. But we may do a bit more tricky stuff than that uh, to give them more elevated levels of access if needed. We can also, when creating that project for them, uh, set up quotas on the project itself. So they've got a memory quota on their workshop instance, but in that project where they can deploy stuff, we can say that you've got quota on there on memory and CPU so they can only deploy so many applications because we don't want them taking over the whole cluster as well. Uh, and similar to having culling of, idle ne culling of idle sessions, we can also hook in uh, additional scripts so that when that user goes away and their session is deleted, we can go and delete all those projects as well. So it gives a way of having ephemeral environments for doing our training. And that's all possible because JupyterHub allows us to hook into the, the machinery of how it starts things up through those different hook points. Uh, and one final example of, of that is that in being able to hook in is that not only when we give them that namespace, we can even pre-create things inside of that uh, project for them. Uh, I may want to deploy a Kubernetes operator which does something magic. Or if you're doing data science, I could deploy a workshop content which teaches you about data science. And one of the things it does is deploy a Jupyter Notebook for you instance into that project as well as other things such as Dask or Spark, and actually then step you through learning how do you do that. And there's my example. Uh, so I could do that. I could actually create these examples uh, for doing that. And it's interesting is that I originally went from JupyterHub and Jupyter Notebooks, I dropped out Jupyter Notebooks, and I have all this ability now to create work area, workspace areas where I can pre-deploy stuff. I can actually go back and drop out my workshop content image and I can put Jupyter Notebooks back. So this actually acts as a really good extension to JupyterHub itself in that you could have this set up so that I could come in as JupyterHub, you get a Jupyter Notebook instance still, but behind the scenes I could create you a project which is pre-deployed Dask or Kubeflow or something else there for you. 
And there's no workshop content, you're direct in your notebook, and that notebook can automatically be tied up to that Dask or Kubeflow instance, so you then actually have a pipeline set up where you can actually start doing data analysis without having to actually deploy anything else yourself. So all their training, it's actually applicable back to JupyterHub and JupyterNote world still as well. So deployment options, uh, we have a whole bunch of different ways we can deploy this because of the way we need to do training. Uh, we have a learning portal one, which is anonymous access, which we technically could put up on the internet and people could come along at any time, do a workshop. When they go away, it all gets cleaned up. Uh, or we have hosted training workshops where we'll have a room of people. We know how many advanced, we'll just set it up, give them logins uh, and so on. And various ways that we can, we can do this. Uh, as for content creation, we actually have a workshop on how to create workshop content. <laughs> uh, so it's a way of forced people to, in order to learn how to do this, we've, uh, well, actually I'm skipping my thinking ahead. <laughs> Let me go backwards again. Um, so in terms of how this works, and I talk, keep mentioning we package things up in container. Uh, so we have... Uh, actually a couple of images here, Docker images, which embody this. One happens to be one which has a terminal in it, uh, which is probably not too relevant here. And then we have this one which has the dashboard that derives from that, which provides us that view which you saw when I demonstrated it before. Uh, and this is where I got onto workshop. Uh, we can bundle up that workshop content as an image and put it up there. And one of those ones we have there is actually a workshop on how to learn how to create workshop content. So success or failure, was it useful to us and how, how, um, what's the outcome at all? Well, this actually started out as a joke. So if you, you consider that it started out as a joke uh, against my boss, uh, it's done really, really well. So my boss, uh, obviously, we're, whoops, we are developer advocates in our team, so he'll go off and do talks. And he had this demo app which he liked to demonstrate, which was this Wild West shooter game. And he'd run up his single instance, and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could actually set up JupyterHub to actually create multiple instances of this, one per person, so they could actually put people in a lecture like this or work in a conference talk, point everyone to that URL and give everyone an instance of their own so they can go on playing this game. So this all started out as a joke. I created an image of his game and I dropped it in there instead of the Jupyter Notebook. So in terms of whether this has been success or not, given I started out as a joke, it's been really, really successful. Um, and the reason it was successful is that JupyterHub provided this really, really nice framework of capabilities that made it simple for me to do this without having to reinvent the wheel. I didn't have to work out this whole infrastructure for how to spawn instances of applications, how to handle authentication, uh, how to handle proxying, all that configuration of aspect of how do I configure it to deal with quotas and all these sorts of, sorts of things in there. So for us, it was actually really worked out really, really well. And something that started out as a joke, and when I showed it to my manager, uh, he went, ha ha. And then when I came back a bit later and say, hey, here's my dashboard with my workshop content, and his next reaction was, yeah, that's really nice, but we're not doing it. Um, his concern was that us as a developer advocate team, uh, we didn't want to get stuck with supporting it. But I actually managed to polish it so much he thought, OK, we'll, we'll start using it ourselves. We had a particular requirement for it with a big conference where we need to have some demos up and running. Um, and we did that. And then other people started seeing it. And actually, it's going a bit crazy now because there's all these different groups in Red Hat now wanting to use it. <laughs> so it got out of control. Um, if you are interested in it, uh, even if you're not interested from the training aspect, which we are, but you, that uh, the bit I uh, mentioned with being able to plug a new notebook back in there, have a Jupyter Notebook instance, but automatically deploy Dask or TensorFlow or Spark or other things behind. If you're interested in that, this is where you can go to look at it. So it's the OpenShift-Homeroom organization on GitHub, um, except it'll be all lowercase. It'll probably, I'm, not, I'm not sure if uh, GitHub will complain if you put that in uppercase. You find all the bits and pieces in there. There's about half a dozen or more different repositories, so you have to dig around. The main one is the, uh, the workshop spawner. Now, right now, though, it does require you to have OpenShift. Uh, hopefully, I'll get to the point where I'll make it so it will work in a, a generic Kubernetes deployment, but right now, you do need OpenShift. But if you are interested, you can go there. And if you're interested at all in OpenShift, uh, just as a little bonus, 
Uh, I actually am the author on two books. Both of these books are freely downloadable. So if you want to learn about OpenShift, you can go there and download the PDFs for both of those for free. Okay. Uh, and there are ways of running up OpenShift uh, yourself on your own uh, system if you wanted to play, for, play with it. Uh, and I don't have any links for that. Um, there's a thing called MiniShift, or there's a new one called Code Ready Containers as well. Uh, and if you did do that and you got this going on your own computer, then you could actually go off and deploy Homeroom yourself on your own machine. And then you can start fiddling with it. So are you interested in uh, talking to me later about this? Uh, this is my contact details. Um, you can send me an email or um, ping me on Twitter if you've got any questions, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. And I think that's my, my last slide. Uh, so if you've got any questions, I have no idea how long time we've got left. Uh, hopefully a few minutes. Otherwise, you can get me in the break and obviously here for the next two days. Um, we've got talks tomorrow and I'll be around for the, the workshop on uh, the Saturday. Okay. <laughs> Was there any questions? One question up the back. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, thank you for my whiskey. I feel like I, uh... I... I always like it when I have users because everyone's going to use Goonicorn and new whiskey these days, which is really annoying. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for not deserting me. <laughs> terrified of kernel exploits and Docker jailbreaks, which happen occasionally. So, you know, it, every, every year there's going to be like a panic moment as a, <laughs> as a new zero day comes out. Uh, you know, I want people to be able to execute arbit arbitrary-ish code so that they can, you know, use the, use the containers, but I'm also, I don't want them to be able to, to take over the yes. whole system. So how, do you have an additional layer of sandboxing or like how, what would you recommend? Okay, so the, um, just so it's on the recording, um, in case it wasn't heard. So the, the question comes around to how can you ensure that your environment is secure when using containers so that uh, people can't break out of containers and do bad stuff, basically. Um, yeah, the, this, at, yeah. yeah, so the important thing is to design your security in layers. Uh, so containerization provides you one level of sandboxing. Now there's a really bad habit out there which really pees me off a lot is that when people run stuff inside of containers, they'll run stuff as root. But you wouldn't do that if it was your own host. But people do it inside a container, they think the container is protecting them. So rule one, don't run stuff in a container as root. That's one layer of security. The sandbox environment provides you the next layer. Even if someone now breaks out of that container, they're no longer root on the host. Okay? Um, in this particular environment where we do stuff in OpenShift, it has other layers of security. It has SE Linux stuff. So the container itself is bound in terms of what things it can do. Privileges are dropped for various things. So it doesn't have Linux capabilities and, uh, enabled such that you can do set GID and set UID. Um, in OpenShift, each namespace or project is forced to run a, a different user ID, not all the same. So even if you set up your container image to be the, run as a particular user ID, it'll force you to run as different user IDs. So that way, if you, again, if you even break out of the container then, one, you're not root, two, you're not the same user ID as some other user. So you can't muck around with their apps or anything on the file system which may be owned by them. So there's all these different layers of security and it's ensuring that when you do use the systems, you're just actually using as many layers of the security as possible so that even if something is compromised, you are reducing as much possible as the damage that can be done. And I don't know whether you've signed up for my workshop on the weekend. Um, one of the more advanced topics of that, which is an optional thing people can skip, is talking about how to design your container images uh, properly so they're portable different runtimes which have these extra security requirements on it. Uh, so I don't know if you signed up for that. 
If you're not, talk to me because I sort of, because I'm using our homeroom content, like I have that uh, workshop running right now. If you had another time, a few hours, I can point you where it is and you can go off and do it. <laughs> I know you're getting a freebie out of that, but if it's really interesting, you can talk to me about it. <laughs> any other questions? Nope, okay, if you've got any more later, you can get me, I'll be around. And, and thank you very much. And we're good, four minutes to go, so we're under time. Thank you.